Hello, welcome back finally to my channel. I haven't posted for a while, so I hope I can get back into it soon. I've been very busy. But we are here to once again finally continue the Byzantine Reconquest series of videos. This is part two, where I talk about a very interesting event. So last time we left off with the Byzantine armies returning eastward towards Constantinople after reconquering the Italian peninsula. I said at the end of that video that something very interesting is about to happen that would uh, put a stop in Justinian's dream and I will not disappoint. Some of you may know about the bacteria Yersinia pestis spread via fleas on the back of mainly black rats. Yersinia pestis is not the friendliest of things. For those who don't know, I'll list some of the names given to the disease caused by this bacteria. Please note that these names were popularised due to the medieval outbreak, not the one I'm talking about today, it was about 800 years after. So, we have the Black Death, the bubonic plague, the blue sickness, or the great mortality, beginning in, guess where, you'll never believe it, China. The plague spread quickly through to the western world from Egypt to Italy in the 540s. So what is this disease? Well, the disease caused by Yersinia pestis is a bacterial disease which can cause both bubonic plague, septicemic plague, and pneumonic plague. That's pneumonic as in pneumonia, not pneumonic as in the thing that you use to remember how to spell words. So, initially, the fleas were on the back of rats in the various cities across the world, and the plague was only affecting the rats at this point. It was spread through the rat population of the empire very, very quickly. And in fact, it was far too quick to the point where the rat population was dying off at such a rate that the, that the disease would run out of hosts. So, faced with this dilemma, there was only one way out for our protagonist or antagonist. <laughs> Find a new host species. The fleas jump from the rats onto dogs, cats, mice, anything else, and that includes human beings. So what the bubonic plague does is initially it creates a flu-like disease which quickly gets out of hand. Within six days of a bite from an infected flea, the person develops a fever chills and achy muscles as well as severe weakness and headaches that's within the first week basically within the first six days so in the preceding days from this the bubbles start for which the disease is so named they begin to appear usually around the groin and underarms and elbows and so on this is because the lymph nodes are in these areas and the bubbles come from infected lymph nodes that have swollen up so without the use of modern antibiotics the disease will cause septicemia and the host will eventually die but with I mean even now there are like 12 plague deaths a year in the US but it's not anywhere near the killer that it used to be because a course of antibiotics will deal with it but back then they obviously didn't have any of that so how was the plague able to sprout up throughout the empire? Well, I mean rats usually do not travel more than 200 meters from their birthplace however another fact about rats is they love to eat and specifically they love to eat grain and they also stray onto the grain ships that are carried around the world, like all the way from like India, that would stop off in the Persian Gulf or the Red Sea in Egypt, and then would go up, like from there, it would be transported all across the Western world, up even to Britain, Scandinavia, everywhere. These th these things 
spread mainly through trade because I mean the grain was transported everywhere Egypt was the breadbasket of the Mediterranean at that point and most of the Mediterranean was owned by the Byzantines this gives these almost stationary rats a sudden and vast increase in range suddenly a rat born in Alexandria in Egypt can find itself in Rome or Paris or Constantinople or Ankara or anywhere across the world I say Egypt because Egypt as I say was the breadbasket of the Roman Empire hence it was where most of the grain was being transported from the war was also a contributing factor in the spread of the disease the fact that armies were on the march and living in conditions and living in the conditions in the camps that were prime prime disease spreading conditions basically oh like close together and not the cleanest like the disease was basically left behind anywhere the armies were so they marched down through the Balkans back into Greece and then to Constantinople and it's like anywhere they had been the plague started pr uh, sprouting up because of the conditions in their camps and it, it only takes one person in a surrounding in a local town to catch it for it to spread throughout that one town so I mean the wars were taking place all over the place they had been taking place in North Africa like all across the North African coast into Italy and Iberia Sicily the like Sardinia and Corsica the Balearics everywhere so as I mentioned the main factor for this I believe to be trade the fact that Constantinople was such a trade hub from which goods were transported throughout Europe and Asia was probably one of the main reasons it was able to spread from Asia in the first place because it's not as if like there were Byzantine armies in China or something like that but there were like Constantinople or Istanbul now is at a choke point between Europe and Asia it is at the separating body of water between Europe and Asia so it is definitely a contributing factor that Constantinople exists at all really the trade routes from China made the city the richest in the known world but it also made a hub from which people across that very same world could arrive and trade when I say the known world, I mean from China, to Britain, to Ethiopia, to Crimea, to the Iberian Peninsula, and possibly Scandinavia as well. It spread everywhere, and it left a wave of death in its wake. A wave, a wave of death whose shadowed hand would extend over roughly a 200 year period. An estimated 25 to 100 million people died across this two century period. Literally, nobody was safe from this. Even Justinian caught the plague, and at its height, around 2,000 people a day just in Constantinople were dying. I mean, Justinian didn't die from it, but he was definitely badly affected. He just seems to be driven by sheer force of will to reunite the Roman Empire. Like, it got so bad that in Constantinople, the army was deployed in order to help the to help dispose of bodies that littered the streets of the city like not even just human bodies as well cats dogs anything that's kept as a pet they were also dying and they were also just lying in the streets so i mean that's not exactly going to be like they, they didn't have hazmat suits so removing bodies lying in the street was not going to be the cleanest or safest of operations either so it would have spread throughout the armies like wildfire like, this is obviously before any modern, modern medical treatment as well. Before there was any sort of germ theory or any antibiotics or anything like that, they were operating, operating with the theory of the humours. Which just means that they thought that any time you were unwell, unwell, the cause was to be found in an imbalance of the humours. Treatments based on this theory were kind of restricted to treatments involving bodily fluids. So if, like, if you manage to survive the plague for context of the level of awareness of the people that we're talking about here, if you survived the plague, you were viewed as being favoured by God and you had a, 
you had you were just naturally strong and like basically very religious outlook so how did the plague actually affect the Byzantines as we know from the last video the Byzantines were in a period of at least geographical growth the reconquest was in full swing and they had just defeated the various Germanic kingdoms that had like sprouted up after the fall of the west that they were scattered across Italy and North Africa and Iberia like Belisarius had been all over them the borders were beginning to look like those of the old Roman Empire the one united Roman Empire so for this reconquest to continue because obviously battles did lead to dead soldiers manpower would be needed in order to reinforce the armies after these battles if many people are dying off your reserve manpower is very low due to the number of deaths from a plague and what's more some of the already standing army had been deployed in the city to help with the cleanup it's definitely going to weaken i mean if i was in the middle of a reconquest and the just the plague of justinian had happened i would hold off for a bit like the people shortage in particular would cause further issues like past just the uh, the reconquest efforts like in terms of trade who are you trading with if there are suddenly ghost towns all over the place if there are less people there are less people to make things like weapon and ar weapons and armor less people to be farmhands and tell the land so probably crop failures and just like, a lot of waste product the empire would be a less enticing trading partner as the situation they're in is so unreliable they would not be able to defend themselves from raids from tribal, tribal people and foreign powers. The fact that there was a major earthquake in Constantinople in 557, almost destroying the city, nearly was nearly completely razed to the ground. That certainly didn't help. The lack of people to pay taxes to the state, in combination with the need to rebuild institutions after the plague, compiled with Justinian's unyielding desire to rebuild the Roman Empire, in my opinion, left it a crippled place. Like, people always get a Heraclius, Heraclius, sorry, but he didn't exactly inherit the best empire, did he? Like, it's no, it's not surprising that the Byzantine Empire began to lose territory almost immediately after gaining it. And almost immediately after Justinian died, like, it was his ambition, the empire's wealth, his pragmatism in appointing the most competent people for the job, and particularly Belisarius' military intelligence that made the reconquest possible. But in the end, his lack of ability to see that now is not the time to continue this mission, you know, right after an actual pandemic of the bubonic plague not coronavirus not this absolute stamp squib of a, a pandemic that we've got just now the time when a major earthquake has just happened and the nika riots so your city's in ruin you should be rebuilding your city defending your borders and focusing on building up some money and reserves but he didn't do this he continued on to attempt the reconquest regardless but this is the topic for the next video, so I'll stop here. I will go through my thoughts on whether these things could have been successfully navigated. Also the effects of the rise of the Arabs to the Muslim conquests, and how the Empire could have dealt with this had they not been in such a weak position. It's amazing to me really that the Romans survived this ordeal, like it's amazing that they survived the crisis of the 3rd century, but it's like major respect really that they managed to limp along for so long it's unreal actually when you see the amount of setbacks the roman empire had that they didn't just collapse over a millennia before they did it's unreal really i mean how on earth that what i mean is the, the only reason that they didn't die completely during the punic wars is because for some reason after Cannae, hannibal refused to march on rome i don't know why he wouldn't do that because he could have destroyed them but anyway, I digress from the topic at hand. <sighs> Thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, hopefully the next one will be soon. But if you enjoyed this video, 
subscribe, share, like the video, tell your friends. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.